Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and tonight is another Conversations with Marty Ross, MD. So as you know, these are webinars where we talk about Lyme disease and uh, how these evolve based on your questions. So I'm interested in seeing what you all have in store for me tonight. For those of you that are coming back here again, welcome back. I see a, a number of familiar names on my message board. I'm glad to see you keep getting some help from these. For those of you that are new here, welcome. I'm glad to see some new people. Uh, the way that you can participate are two, two ways. Number one, you can listen in as I read questions. And if you're in the live version, you'll actually be able to see them on the screen as well too. But you can see what responses I give to those questions. And there's always some good information uh, that you can pick up that might help uh, change your, your Lyme disease treatment. Second way you can participate is actually uh, be bold and, and write a question to me. And the way you do that is in the bottom of your screen on the right hand side at the bottom is a chat box and you can write your question to me through that chat box. Now, as usual, I am creating a, rec oh, the one thing about writing that question, um, I have to remind people, don't click the enter key multiple times to create paragraphs. If you do that, it sends multiple questions my direction. It gets really hard for me to follow. So I ask that you only hit the enter key once and write a big, long, run-on paragraph that goes on. Um, you don't have to try to break your question into multiple paragraphs, OK? All right. And then, uh, yeah, I am creating a recording tonight's webinar. And uh, tomorrow morning, somewhere between 9 and 9.30 AM, um, I, I will have it complete and get it out to you, hopefully before then, actually. Uh, I have to do a brief edit on uh, the video. And also, I try to create a summary, uh, a write-up, a summary of that um, as well, too. And so um, I'll be getting that tonight and tomorrow morning. Um, when you get that email, um, feel free to share it with others that you think may get some benefit. Uh, and in fact, whenever you get an email from me that um, asks you to sign up for these webinars, send those on too, because people get benefit and, and if they know about this. So help me reach people. I'm trying to reach as many people as possible. Okay. And then let's see here. I don't think I have any other new announcements here. Let's go ahead and get started. Hello, Pat. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. I understand Bartonella can cause stabbing pains in the balls of my feet, but is it possible either mold or candida could also do that? After treating Bart years ago, it seems these pains in the balls of my feet are back intermittently, but more often and for longer stretches of time than before. Do you know why this could be happening? All right, let me answer that first, and I see you have a second question here. But um, <clears throat> so... Stabbing pains means neurologic pain or pain from neuro nerve injury, okay? And things that can give nerve injury, um, Bartonella can be one of those. Uh, mold toxicity can be another. Um, but there's other, other things too, like diabetes, for instance, uh, can lead to neuropathy. Um, and uh, I haven't seen neuro neurologic pain occur from yeast, as you're asking here, I ha I've seen neurologic pain uh, happen due to toxicity and mold toxicity. Um, if you've got neurologic pain returning, um, it could be that it's a different problem than the last time, okay? So the basic workup of any neuropathy is to get um, thyroid studies, uh, get blood count done, get uh, kidney liver testing, and to, to do, um, I, I didn't say it already, thyroid studies, and sometimes vitamin B12, and sometimes vitamin D levels as well, too. That's usually where I'll start on uh, doing uh, evaluations. Keep in mind that about 50% of the time that people have neuropathy, we can't identify actual unknown cause. Um, and so, but anyhow, I would, I, if it's been a long time, I would go back and talk to your docs again and see if they can help you figure out why this might be happening and don't necessarily assume that it's Bartonella uh, injury or something returning from Bartonella. Okay. All right. And then let's see, number two, asking for their Lyme friend, what is your opinion of the spectra cell test where they test to see what is actually getting into the cells and not just floating around the blood? Under what circumstances might it be useful? Thank you so much for help. So uh, you're welcome. So a spectrocell runs a test where they can um, they measure micronutrients within your cells, not in the blood, um, but actually within the cells. And that's different than like regular labs. They're like if you order a magnesium from LabCorp or Quest, they're measuring what's in the blood, the liquid part of your blood, not inside the cells, for instance. Okay. 
Um, I don't regularly use it. I, I'm aware of it. I did at one time try it with a number of people, but I didn't find that correcting a lot of the abnormalities that was seen on a spectra cell test made much difference. Um, if I were to do it these days, where I would probably do it is the situations where I've got somebody with ongoing fatigue, where we've corrected everything I know to correct for fatigue, like getting your germs under control, lowering your cytokines, correcting hormonal imbalances, um, getting sleep, and uh, doing a repair of your cell energy factories called mitochondria. If you do all that, and let's say you're six months to a year into treatment and you're not making any headway on energy, then you might wanna do a spectra cell analysis and just see, are you even able to get nutrients uh, into the cells? That might be a situation where I would wind up doing that, okay? All right, thanks for your question. Hello, Alex. Hi, Dr. Ross. I just received my real-time labs back, and after nine months of treating, only trichocetine shows is equivocal, and the rest are not present. Should I continue treating until I reach the not present with two pills of micropole a day, or switch to one pill a day and retest and say, another four months? Um, also, once I'm done, do you keep your patients on micropole, say, one pill a day for maintenance? Are there any long-term effects, problems of using Mycopole for years, if that's the case? My GP uh, states, since there are, isn't any studies regarding long-term effects of using herbal supplements, he's a little concerned about long-term use. All right. So he's right. I mean, there, there, we, we don't have uh, studies looking at a lot of these herbs and what, what the long-term consequences are of being on them. Okay. Um, but I, I, these look pretty inert to me. Um, and I have people that do stay on them long term sometimes, and I haven't had uh, problems. But but your physician raises a good point in terms of um, should you stop treating. So when you know testing doesn't tell us whether you're well. All right. So even though trichocetine is showing up on your test still in an equivocal range, the issue is does that give you any problems? All right. So. If, you're, if you don't have any problems, let's say you've got great energy, your brain's working well again, your body pain is all gone, and you have an equivocal, I, you're, you're out of the high range and you don't have symptoms in that kind of situation, I usually don't treat my patients, okay? All right. So if you do have symptoms still and you're in equivocal range, then yeah, I would try to, to, try to treat uh, long enough to get that into a normal um, uh, below, you know, into the normal range, below the uh, equivocal range, okay? All right, then in terms of how do you handle binders after you, you've you gotten yourself well, do you still need to be on them? And so, I, you know, I think it all depends. If you think that you have um, secured the common places that you live, meaning your home and your workplaces, and you know that there is not mold are not mold exposures that you have going on there and you know that probably from some testing being done of those facilities and they come back clean you probably don't need to stay on binders chronically if on the other hand you um, are still going in and out of buildings that might have mold behind the walls and you can't secure your home well enough and you can't secure your work environment well enough then in those kind of situations i have people stay on maybe one pill a day or two pills a day, um, usually more one pill a day, all right? So it all depends on whether you think you still have ongoing exposures. And that's one way to do it, okay? Just stay on them chronically. Um, there is a patient of mine that has kind of a novel way that she's come up with um, to do this. And she's extremely in tune with her body. And she can tell when she's starting to get more fatigued and more achy that it probably means she's picked up a bunch of mold toxins again. And so about maybe once a year, she does about a week worth of her binder, which is cholesteramine, and she's back on her way again. So she waits to see until she starts developing minor symptoms of it. All right. So there isn't a right or wrong way here. But um, if you think you have a really clean environment, work environment, home environment, you may not need to keep using these. Um, if you think you're going to have periodic exposures, then you could either wait until you start getting symptomatic and then try to put, go back on binders until you get well, or you could um, just stay on one one pill a day. I'll do that with some of my patients as well too, okay? All right, so Mycopole, everyone, is a binder that is used to pull mold toxins out for people that develop mold toxicity. 
And so for those of you that are not familiar with it, um, there's about 25% of all people, whether you have Lyme disease or don't have Lyme disease, that have a genetic programming um, error or predisposition that sets them up so that they can't remove mold toxins when they breathe them in from the body or the environment. So what happens is you, you're, you go into a building that has mold behind the walls and you breathe in the mold toxins. What happens in 75% of us is those toxins get absorbed from the lungs into the bloodstream. And once they're in the bloodstream, some of the immune cells will tag those mold toxins and then other immune cells will come in and break them down. And we never have problems with them again. If you're one of the 25% with this genetic programming error, the, when you breathe in these mold toxins, they get into your bloodstream, they don't get tagged by the immune system and they don't get broken down. Then they go to the liver. The liver's job is to take a fat-based toxin like a mold toxin, and it's supposed to transform them into a water-soluble toxin. And then they're supposed to get moved out into the intestines. And then in the intestines being water-soluble, they mix in with our poop and we poop them out. Okay, that's what's supposed to happen. However, um, the liver is not able to transform these into water-based toxins. So they go out into the intestines still as a fat-based toxin and they get a reabsorbed back into your bloodstream. So you just get this endless loop of toxins going around. And what those mold toxins do is they trigger your white blood cells to manufacture a bunch of chemicals called cytokines. Just like Lyme infection triggers your immune system to overmake a bunch of chemicals called cytokines. And so you get cytokine excess symptoms and those excess symptoms give you insomnia, sleep difficulty, um, thinking problems, um, uh, body pain, joint pains, hormonal deficiencies. So what we call Lyme disease symptoms and mold toxicity symptoms look pretty similar because they both ultimately trigger too many cytokines to be made. Okay. All right. So that what you do is you use a binder, something that can grab hold of those mold toxins out in the intestines to keep them from getting reabsorbed. And Mycopole happens to be a binder made by research nutritionals that has a variety of things in it, like charcoal, like clay, that can help bind up these toxins to pull them out of you, okay? For those of you that are new to this whole thing, let me just do a quick screen share for you. I'll show you my article that you can look at and get more information on this. All right, so... All right, so this is my information site, my treat line by Marty Ross MD site. And you could look, you could find the article on mold uh, toxicity here in the detoxification section. And it's this article right here called Bold and Lyme Toxin Illness, where I talk about uh, how you get this, how do you test for it, and how do you treat it? It's all right there, okay? Thanks for the question, Alex. Hello, Kim. Let's see. Thank you for taking my questions. You're welcome. Let's see. I was undiagnosed for over 13 years. I have Lyme and Alpha Gal. I've been seeing an LMD and I'm currently on my fourth month of Doxy, about to change clindamycin, uh, alternating with Zithromax. I have checked with the manufacturer for mammalian. I read in Rawls' Lyme book where one shouldn't take oral condomycin. Any comment? Also, if you could elaborate on how you treat your alpha-gal patients that have Lyme or do not run into it. In our state, the Lone Star Tick, not Texas, is common. Also, I'm one of the rare ones that had a clear reaction to Baluki antihistamine controlled it, allergic to soy, trying fish oil, but it leaves me with a headache. Added bromelain and thinking about starting Japanese knotweed since it has blood thinning aspects. Any suggestions? I have a wish all MDs would label their products alpha gal free or not. So, you know, the, um, just a comment, I'm sorry, you've got the alpha gal. So alpha gal, everyone is, um, is a situation that can develop from the bite of a lone star tick and people develop allergies um, to alpha-gal. I'm not experienced managing it, so I'm afraid I'm not gonna be able to give you some good advice. Um, clearly, you have to avoid the things that you're reacting to, and I know you're requesting that we put that on the labels of our supplements so that you know if it's got alpha-gal in it or not. 
the problem with that is it's not the physicians, it's the manufacturers that should that could be labeling and um, uh, we, we, I can't add another label on top of the manufacturer's label, unfortunately. Um, I, I don't have some good suggestions for you on that one. I'm sorry about that, but that's not an area that I have had to deal with yet other than being aware of it, basically. Um, in terms of clindamycin, I, I don't agree with Rawls. Uh, you know, Dr. Rawls um, got well treating his Lyme um, herbally and is a big proponent of using herbs over prescription antibiotics. That's his um, angle on it and his belief on it, okay? Um, as you know, I kind of take more of a mixed approach. I, I think for some people, prescription antibiotics are the way to go. And I think for some other people, herbal antibiotics are the way to go. And sometimes I think you just mix it all together. Um, I'm willing to look at any tools we have in our tool bag, okay? But his predisposition is against prescription antibiotics. Um, I'm not clear what his specific concerns are about clindamycin other than um, clindamycin compared to other prescription antibiotics is known to have a higher chance of causing um, a problem in your intestines called C. difficile. Uh, C. difficile is basically, it's a normal bacteria that lives in our intestines, but if it grows too much, it will release toxins that um, cause you to have just terrible, terrible diarrhea. And uh, clindamycin is an antibiotic that has a higher probability of that happening. Uh, but but it doesn't mean you will get the problem from being on clindamycin. So that could be why he's uh, resistant to it. Um, I don't know for sure. I've never had a conversation with him about it. And I haven't, I have looked at his books before, but I haven't seen, I'm not remembering him uh, commenting on uh, clindamycin in that. Let's see. Yeah, I, I mean, I... I, the only times I use clindamycin in my practice is as part of a Babesia treatment. And that is if every other kind of Babesia treatment has failed. One of the older ways to treat uh, Babesia and malaria is to use a combination of clindamycin and quinine or a quinine derivative called a uh, Plaquenil. And it can be effective. It has a lot of side effects. And so most of us don't use it these days. But that's those are the only times I have really used clindamycin as part of my treatments. Clindamycin could also be useful for uh, treating spirochete Lyme. Um, it works in a similar fashion, I believe, to the way that penicillins do. And that it, it, it injure or it makes it so that um, it works on you know, the cell covering of spirochetes um, so that they can't repair themselves when they get damaged, uh, basically. Um, I think, I believe that's the mechanism of action. Uh, but again, the only times I really use it is part of a Babesia treatment. All right. All right. Um, good luck to you. And um, I, I understand you're concerned about the alpha gal. I, 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 I think we'd have to get some of the manufacturers to start doing that for us. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, Kim. Hello, Lynn. Hi, Dr. Ross. How do you recommend detoxing for heavy metals, specifically lead and cadmium and antimony? Um, so <clears throat> this is, I'd have to look into this one. I don't know off the top of my head. So the, there's different, um, the agents that we use to pull heavy metals out of you are called chelating agents, okay? And there are some that you can use IV. There are some that you can use prescriptively. One of the more common oral agents is something called DMSA. And that one is, I, I, that when I have worked with chelation agents, that tends to be the one I use because you can get it orally. You know, you're not stuck to having it done IV. Um, but each of the chelating agents we have, whether it's DMSA, um, DMSO is another one, EDTA, these are the prescriptive ones. They all have um, different affinities for different heavy metals. And um, while the DMSA and EDTA, and I even believe the DMSO is gonna be good for lead, I am not sure off the top of my head whether that's got good enough affinities for the cadmium or the antimony. So um, I don't know, I would have to look into it and have to go study and see which, which of the chelating agents we can use would be good for those. And I, and I don't know that off the top of my head. Okay. All right. Thanks for your question, Lynn.
Hello, Laura. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Thank you for these webinars. You're welcome. Let's see. I'm starting to become more curious about parasites. I've never been tested or treated for parasites, but I suspect some of my symptoms may be related to parasites and gut dysfunction. Can you please come on and testing and treatment for parasites? Yeah. So, and I actually have a, an article about this too. So um, let me just talk globally about parasites. I know that um, there are some of my colleagues that believe that it, that you can get parasite infections in your bloodstream, um, and that is what uh, can keep people um, unwell in chronic Lyme disease. In terms of chronic Lyme disease, the true parasite in our blood that causes problems is one of the co-infections called Babesia. Okay, so Babesia is a parasite that lives inside of your red blood cells, all right? But the most common kind of problem that people have with parasites is intestinal parasites. And that is the more common problem people would have. So in terms of testing for intestinal parasites, there are companies, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to detect intestinal parasites, okay? Um, in fact, there's been studies done looking at how effective testing is, uh, looking under the microscope, um, looking at your stool samples, looking under the microscope to detect parasites, and it, it, it misses it a lot of the time. And um, so if you're going to, usually if I suspect having intestinal parasites, is there going to be people that have intestinal gassiness and bloating and fatigue, and they don't have yeast, and if I suspect maybe parasites could be part of that uh, picture, then I might do testing, but I'm not going to do it through a lab core or a quest. And that is because the person that's going to look at your poop there under the microscope is usually low down on the totem pole. You want to find a lab that has more skill at looking for parasites out of the microscope. And the lab that I like using to do that is a lab called Genova Diagnostics. Um, but there are other labs that, that do these comprehensive stool tests where you can get somebody to look under the microscope. Um, but if, if testing comes back negative, um, so I would do a comprehensive stool analysis and see do parasites show up on that. Also, there is some um, uh, antibody testing you can do to see if you have them in the parasites in your stool as well, too. It's an EIA studies for certain parasites. But if those all come back normal, then I start, and if somebody still have some of a lot of intestinal issues, then I want to know what the history tells me. I want to know, is there a history that suggests that they might have had intestinal parasite exposure, okay? So your greatest risk of getting intestinal parasites is uh, travel to uh, less developed regions of the world where the food might have been contaminated that you ate. So I'll take a travel history. And if somebody notes they traveled to Mexico and they had picked up a stomach bug while they were there, that has me thinking maybe there's some parasites that were part of that, okay? Um, the other thing I'll do is uh, look at is somebody drink a lot of well water. Um, well water, even though the wellhead may be clean, still possibly could have some parasites in it as well, too. So I want to, and then uh, hikers that have drank out of uh, streams, you wonder um, about whether they could have picked up some parasites, too. So I've got somebody that has risk of getting parasites in their intestines, either because of international travel or because of drinking from well water or from um, um, hiking and drinking out of mountain streams and they have intestinal issues even if their testing is negative for parasites i might treat anyhow and what i like using in situations like that is a prescription medication called alinea the reason i like using alinea is it is a um, very broad spectrum Antiparasitic, meaning it can kill a whole range of parasites. Okay, it's kind of it's like your shotgun. Instead of bringing a rifle out um, that that hits one thing at a time, this is a shotgun that just blows out all kinds of shots and can kill a wide range of parasites. All right, so in situations like that, I'll do a linea 500 milligrams uh, twice a day, and I'll do it for three weeks. Um, I got to tell you, it's expensive, and so if I am going to do that, I'm usually going to buy through one of the Canadian. Um, International pharmacies, um, they tend to source their materials out of some respectable pharmacies in India, and you can get fairly decent pricing compared to U.S. pricing, which is going to be astronomical. Because um, uh, typically insurance will not pay for this because they're going to want proof that you have a parasite. Right? Now, 
why would I even test for parasites? Well, if you can't identify on testing which parasite you have, then you can use a targeted treatment targeted just to that parasite. And you don't have to pay for the, the shotgun of Alinea, basically, okay? Uh, if you are another option to treating for parasites rather than using the prescription Alinea would be to use a compound that ha has a black walnut in it, uh, artemisinin could be in it, but you want to get an herbal um, antiparasitic compound, and those would become some of the common things that would be found in it as well, too. And again, up to about three weeks is what I would do for that. Okay. All right. So let me just do a quick screen share here for you. I'll show you that article. All right, so again, the focus on this article is more intestinal parasites, okay? Um, and I talk about how to test, consider your risk, consider, look at your symptoms. And then um, in terms of herbs, uh, black walnut, artemisinin, and oregano oil actually is another one to use as well too, or a uh, biocidin, uh, which is a broad spectrum herbal antimicrobial. It has about 10 different herbs in it, could be a useful option here as well too, okay? Thanks for the question, Laura. Good luck. Hello, Pat. Let's see here. Is it best to ask our questions in chat or Q and A? Um, I I prefer people to do it in the chat. Um, at one time I was asking you to do it more in the Q and A box, but in the chat, I you know, have a better chance I'm going to see it there. I do look at both areas but I tend to spend more time in the chat chat uh, format. Okay, all right. Thanks for the question, Pat. Hello, Mary. Hi, Dr. Ross. I, have, I love the detailed treatments you list in your most recent book, Hacking Lyme. Thank you for writing it for us. It is excellent. Ah, thank you. I'm glad you found it helpful. See, what would be your first tier treatment for treating Babesia, Bartonella, and Lyme together? If you have time, what would be your second tier treatment as well? Okay. So a word about treating um, Lyme, Bartonella, and Babesia together. Um, so one of my mentors in, in, as I was learning how to treat Lyme was a physician named Burriscano. Many, many of you may be aware of him. He's one of the pioneers in treating Lyme here in this country. Um, he's no longer treating, um, but he, he was out on Long Island and had just, you know, thousands of patients he treated. One of his observations in his practice is that if you had somebody that had both uh, Bartonella and Babesia, um, that if you tried to go after Babesia first before Bartonella, um, that you, um, that it would be more difficult to get rid of the Bartonella. All right. So in my practice, what I tend to do is if I've got somebody with all three germs, I'm usually going to start treating for both Lyme and Bartonella first. Try to start getting some of the Bartonella symptoms to improve, meaning we're starting to, that we're, we are in an effective treatment. Then I might add in Babesia treatment at the same time. Okay. Um, I, I, I do that from time to time. Sometimes I'll treat Lyme and Bartonella first, clear the Bartonella, and then add treatment for Babesia at that point. But if you, one way that you could do this, uh, uh, one one way to do it would be to use a um, would be to use um, clarithromycin, uh, which is useful. Uh, well, clarithromycin and fluconazole and malarone. Now, let me just talk to you about that. Okay. So the clarithromycin will treat growing Lyme. It will be part of a Bartonella treatment and it can be part of a Babesia treatment, okay? The malarone is your Babesia, main Babesia agent supported by the clarithromycin. And the fluconazole, diflucan, is useful at treating cyst form of Lyme, and cyst growing Lyme 
and is useful at treating growing and persisting forms of Bartonella. All right. I would I would go on those three, and then at some point I might add in a liposomal cinnamon clove oregano capsule, one capsule twice a day, to start getting at persister Lyme and to strengthen the persister Bartonella treatment. Okay. That, that's one way that you could uh, skin that cat. Um, a second tier treatment. Uh, boy, there's a lot of different ways to go there. Um, I, I think I'm just going to leave it at that as the first tier treatment for you there. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, so let me explain some terms here to everyone. So if you notice, I said for Lyme that there's growing and persister Lyme. And I said that the clarithromycin treats growing spirochete and that the diflucan can treat growing cyst. All right. The clarithromycin also treats intracellular Lyme as well, too. All right. So let's talk terminology here. So the Lyme germ has three different appearances. And so one form is called the spirochete. It's a corkscrew looking thing. There's another form called an L form, which moves inside of cells, or we also call that intracellular Lyme. And then the, finally, there is a cyst form. All right. Now, the cyst and the spirochete can exist in both a growing state and in a hibernating or persister state. All right. It's possible intracellular Lyme exists in both those states too, but we, we, we haven't, can't see into the microscope to see whether they really do or not, intracellular, whether they go into persisters or not, okay? As we design treatments, we want to hit both the growth phase and the hibernating phase. And so that's why I was using those terms, okay? All right. Uh, good luck to you, Mary. And yes, I did talk to say to use diflucan, which you think of as a yeast medicine, also known as fluconazole, to treat Bartonella and to treat Lyme. And on the Bartonella front, I did that based on research that showed a brother or sister of uh, fluconazole called clotrimazole is effective at treating uh, growing and persister forms of Bartonella in the lab. It's not available in any kind of a pill form, so I decided to try fluconazole, its brother or sister, and found some really good results with it, okay? Um, as an anti-Lyme agent, uh, fluconazole is part of a family called the azoles, and our two of our leading cyst agents to kill Lyme cyst are metronidazole, which is flagell, and tinidazole, which is also known as tindamax. Notice how they all end in azole, well, fluconazole, so they're all azoles, okay? And so fluconazole has, is, has some ability to treat cyst as well too, okay? Hello, Katie, part one. Hello, Dr. Ross. You are a true humanitarian. <laughs> that, Katie, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I have Lyme diagnosed with rash and EM 2021, vibrant wellness with tick test showing IgG for Burgdorferi, Afzeli, and uh, Miomata. I understand you do not like the rest of the test. I did, however, test IgG and IgM for Bart Henseli. I use the checklist for symptoms. I know I have BART left. I am still on biaxin, diflucan, and I take your cinnamon clove combo. I even added cryptolepis. I think I have Babesia, but I have toxoplasmosis and believe it is chronic and activist. My symptoms fit almost like Babesia. I am IgG, IgM positive for toxoplasmosis and Gandhi. Symptoms fit Babesia, air hunger, and sweating, but now believe it is Gandhi. I am hypopituitary, making my, me immune compromised. My doc put me on a six-week course of permethrin, 50 milligram, sulfdiazine, 2,000 milligrams a day, clindamycin, 1,200 a day, and leucovorin. My sweating stopped but I was so sick from the permethrin. Part two, I will not do it again. I was, it was really harsh. And now my sweating symptoms and other toxic symptoms returned. A lot of information on PubMed, and I know you know this, 
with etovaquone with high dose azithromycin or spiromycin and combos. Please help me simplify my BART and toxoplasmosis Gondi meds. I would like to try etovaquone. I am an RNBSN. Ah, boy. You know, um, I would love to help you, but I, I'm, I'm going to be stumped here. So I don't, I haven't had the occasion to treat toxoplasmosis. And so I don't have working knowledge of it off the top of my head in a way that I could go through and streamline the rest of your treatment for you, unfortunately. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. I'm, I'm not going to be a good source for you here right now. Uh, if you were a patient of mine, I would spend some time studying it and figure out how I was going to do it. But off the top of my head, I, I don't know at this point. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck, Kate. Hello, Carol. I'll see, what are your thoughts about ivermectin for Lyme treatment? Um, so there is no studies done that show ivermectin kills Lyme. Okay, I'll just start by saying that. Um, we have no evidence that it is a killer of Lyme. There are some of my colleagues that use it as part of their Lyme treatments, and there are times when people do feel they get some improvement. The reason I think they may get improvement is not necessarily from killing of Lyme, but rather ivermectin can modulate or regulate uh, cytokine inflammation. And as you know, earlier tonight, as I was um, as we as as I was describing earlier, Lyme symptoms are actually due to the immune system overproducing inflammation chemicals called cytokines. Okay. And so uh, ivermectin could help regulate those, all right? But, you know, as part of the pandemic, everyone started thinking ivermectin was the wonder drug. It could kill viruses, kill COVID, uh, kill parasites, and kill um, Lyme. But truly, it's a good antiparasitic. The data initially looked like it might help uh, with COVID, but further randomized studies that have been done, my interpretation is this is not a good agent even for COVID. Um, um, I know <laughs> some of you may be out there screaming at me for saying that, but there have been some randomized studies that actually are not being done by the cheerleaders who cheer for ivermectin. And when they're done independent, it looks like it probably is not an effective agent against uh, COVID-19. Um, but in terms of Lyme, I, I wouldn't use it as a Lyme agent. Um, other than, again, I admit some people do feel better on it, but it's probably more from its uh, uh, cytokine regulation effect. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Carol. Hello, DD. Any natural nematode treatments? GEMSEC definitely recommended I add it to my protocol based on testing. Thanks. Off the top of my head, I don't know one. Um, that doesn't mean they're not there. That's something I'd have to look up. I don't know. You guys are stumping me tonight, but no, that one I don't know. Sorry about that, DD. Hello, Carol. Let's see. I've heard protocol should be changed every three months. What are your thoughts? Um, so there's no science that backs what is the best frequency to change treatments. Okay. Uh, one possible reason to change treatments is to prevent resistance developing to the antibiotics. My own way that I practice is to start somebody on something and, and a month or two in, if it looks like it's helping, I'll leave them on it and not change for up to six months. But that's because I'm trying to prevent resistance developing, but there's no science that guides that. And even every three months, there's no science that says every three months. But I wanna let you know in my practice, I leave people on, put people on stuff and leave them on for about six months and get good progress with it. So I, I'm not clear that we need to be rotating every three months, okay? Thanks for the question.
Hello, Carter. Any non-prescription antifungals that I can start slow with? So, um, so prescription antifungals um, or non, I'm sorry, non-prescription antifungals are, would be herbal antifungals. And agents, herbs, and supplements that can treat fungus include a garlic, pardarco, uh, grapefruit seed extract, caprylic acid, any of the volatile oils like clove, oregano, thyme, um, oils, um, cinnamon oils, they can all uh, treat uh, fungus and yeast as well too. Um, I think those are the big ones. So you could look at an, um, products that have a number of those in it. So for instance, there's a product by um, Karuna called Capri Plus that I like to use that has in it caprylic acid, some garlic and uh, oregano oil. So it's got three different things in it. There's another product I use sometimes called Phytostan. Phytostan has in it uh, uh, powder co, caprylic acid, uh, rosemary oil, thyme oil, and I think undulacinic acid is in that one as well too. But any of them are, are, are viable options. If you want to start low and slow with that, what I sometimes will have people do is take start by taking one pill a day. And as you can tolerate it from a Herx reaction standpoint, gradually increase up to two pills twice a day. Right? Um, and as usual, if you're going to treat uh, like yeast in your intestines, if that's the kind of fungus you're trying to treat, um, then I would make sure you're on good probiotics as well, too. OK, right. thanks for the question. Hello, Eleanor Ross. Yeah, Dr. Ross. Initially, I tested positive for tick-borne relapsing fever, multiple strains of BART, IgM, um, Borrelia burgdorferi. I have been treating the above infections for seven months now per your antibiotic combinations. I recently retested through Igenix Lab and tested negative for all the above infections. However, tested IgM positive for Ehrlichia and uh, Babesia. Some of the previous symptoms have improved but new ones have popped up. My questions are, should I pursue Babesia treatment solely or should I stay on protocols covering Bart, Borrelli, and Babesia? Two, what antibiotic protocol would you put someone on with my infection history? Three, a main symptom that I struggle with is severe joint inflammation in one finger only. Is Babesia infection considered inflammatory or could it be one of the other infections? And four, is Diflucan a Borrelia cyst buster? Can Diflucan be taken with Mepron? Thank you. I appreciate your help. All right. So let me see if I can get through all of those. That's a lot of questions. All right. Uh, so first of all, um, I'll make a few statements. Number, number one, uh, peeling lime is like peeling layers of an onion. All right. So as you start clearing some of the initial infections that you're treating, sometimes uh, the symptoms of another co-infection that you didn't think a person had will start to pop up, all right? And so part of my practice whenever I treat is I'm always, every visit after I've determined somebody has Lyme infection, I usually will go back once a month, once every two months, and go back through the main symptom list that I attribute to Babesia and Bartonella to see is it apparent now that one of those infections might be there. So at a first visit, somebody might not have all the night sweats and the air hunger that you would expect somebody with Babesia. But as you go further into treatment, they start developing those symptoms. And I think it's just because you peeled a layer and it's now more obvious that those uh, symptoms are there basically. Okay. Now, that's based on symptoms. Now, testing. Um, the thing about testing, and, and these are all antibody tests, um, when you first have start treating on before you start treating there's a lot of immune suppression going on and therefore you might not be able to detect antibodies against one of these infections like the air leaky i think you said here and the babesia the your immune system just may have not been able to make them because of immune suppression all right so if you develop antibodies that actually has some meaning it means your immune system probably is working better and yeah you should consider whether you have those infections in you or not okay all right. However, if antibodies go away, 
while you're under treatment, that does not necessarily mean the infection is gone. All right. Because the infection could be gone because the immune system now is suppressed against making antibodies against that infection. All right. The other thing is with Lyme, especially Lyme can hide in areas of the body and um, away from blood flow and the immune system may not see all of them and therefore stop responding and making uh, antibodies. So testing to see if you're done is not useful. It could be wrong. Okay. But if you do develop antibodies against a germ further into treatment, it may mean that your immune system now for that germ is not as suppressed and can start making those antibodies. And that does have meaning. Okay. Now, one other point I'll make is if you test positive for an infection, but have no symptoms of that infection, you may not have it. It could be a false positive test. All right. So if I've got a person that tests positive for Babesia, but they have no Babesia symptoms, I may not treat for Babesia. All right. So what would Babesia symptoms be? Well, one of the common ones is severe fatigue. Okay. So probably everyone has fatigue with Lyme. So, uh, but, so it would make you think, do they have, if it, is it real if they have fatigue? But the major symptoms of Babesia would be um, uh, drenching night sweats, uh, air hunger, uh, racing and skipping of the heart, uh, getting faint easily when you stand up, uh, frontal headaches, and some people have uh, very frequent uh, report, very frequent deja vu experiences as well too, okay? So those would be things that would make you think about it, okay? All right. So to answer your questions, should you pursue Babesia treatment solely, what I would say is the Lyme germ on average takes a year to two years to get over, okay? And if you're having any degree of fatigue, any cognitive dysfunction, still with body pain, you probably still have active Lyme. So I wouldn't base your decision to treat Lyme based on negative antibodies, okay? Tick-borne relapsing fever, if you have been, usually is a one to two month treatment for most people. So that could be that that is gone if you don't have symptoms of it. Um, but keep in mind, tick-borne relapsing fever, some people with tick-borne relapsing fever actually do get fevers that come and go. But uh, sometimes it actually just behaves a lot more like Lyme. And so however you approach Lyme, usually is going, Lyme infection is usually going to be effective against the tick-borne relapsing fever as well too. Okay. All right. Then let's see. In terms of so in terms of do you still need to keep treating BART? As I said, Lyme, you can assume it's going to be at least a year or more. All right. And again, if you have any fatigue, uh, any brain fog, any body pains, Lyme is probably still there. Bartonella, usually four to six months of treatment is going to get rid of Bart in about 80 to 85 percent of people. And so you need to look back at originally before you started treating what Bartonella symptoms were there and are they gone now? All right. So common Bartonella symptoms can be pain in the balls of the feet. Uh, air hunger can also be part of Bartonella um, and Babesia, both of them. A severe, severe cognitive dysfunction sometimes is part of Bartonella. Uh, anything that's neuropsych, so people that have hallucinations, um, bad depression, ongoing anxiety that often is part of Bartonella, can be part of Lyme, but often is part of Bartonella. And uh, neurologic dysfunctions or neuropathies, think Bartonella, although Lyme can do those as well too. But look back at those kind of symptoms and say, were they there at the beginning? And if they're all gone now, that kind of genre of Bartonella symptoms, I said, maybe you're done treating Bartonella based on symptoms. Okay. All right. Let's see. Should I pursue Babesia treatment solely? The answer is probably not. You probably still have some Lyme there. From what you've told me here, I can't tell from symptoms whether you still have Bartonella or not. But I would look at the Bartonella symptom list to determine that. Okay. Uh, number two, what antibiotic protocol would you put someone on with my infection history? Um, we got Bart, Lyme, tick-borne relapsing fever. Ehrlichian and Bambis. Okay, so if... Uh, probably one of the better agents to treat Ehrlichia is going to be doxycycline, okay? And doxy is also very effective against Lyme, can be part of Bartonella, can be part of a Babesia treatment. So I probably would go doxycycline. Um, I would, for the Babesia, initially try to use um, malarone, and malarone coupled with doxy is a good Babesia treatment. 
You could use doxy and fluconazole uh, to treat Bartonella, and you could use doxy and fluconazole to treat Lyme. Um, and then I would probably pick up a liposomal cinnamon clove oregano to make the uh, uh, persister treatment stronger. But keep in mind, fluconazole can treat persister Bartonella. Probably doesn't do anything against persister Lyme, though. Okay. All right. So a regimen that could hit all those and cover Ehrlichia, pick up the tick-borne relapsing fever, uh, would be a doxy, diflucan, malaria. That could possibly pick all those up, okay? But you have to, and then watch what your symptoms do. Do, do your symptoms start clearing within a couple months uh, on the uh, on the the Bambesi and the on the Bartonella side, okay? All right. Let's see. Three, a main symptom they struggle with severe joint infection in one finger only. Is Babesi infection considered inflammatory or could it be one of the other infections? Uh, for joint pains, I'm going to be thinking more Bartonella or Lyme, not Babesia. And so, no, I usually don't see it being inflammatory in the joints. Number four, is Diflucan a Borrelia cystbuster? Can Diflucan be taken with Mepron? Thank you. So, yeah, Diflucan um, I use as a cystbuster. I use it to treat yeast. I use it to treat uh, Bartonella, growing Bartonella, and persisting Bartonella. I'd use it for all those. Um, I was saying take it with malarone. Malarone is made up of a tovaquone, which is in your Mepron. And it's a pill form, though. Um, Melorin's a pill form. Mepron's a liquid. The amount of uh, atovaquone in Mepron liquid per teaspoon is 750 milligrams. And you usually do a teaspoon twice a day versus the amount of atovaquone that is in a Mepron or Melorone pill is 250 milligrams. But in that pill, it's combined with a quinine derivative called Proquinil. And because it's with that quinine derivative, you do not need to take uh, the amount of um, uh, that you would in just a uh, vitovacone that you would in the mepron. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, you could do diflucan with either mepron or you could do it with the atovacone proconol, which is also known as malarone. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck, Eleanor. Thanks for your question. Or well, questions, I should say. Hello, Goli. Let's see. Hello. How long do you have to take the methylene blue for um, until you get your desired results? So if you're using it to treat Bartonella and it seems to be working, then I would take it until your Bartonella symptoms are gone. If you're using it uh, to treat Lyme and using it as your anti-persister agent for Lyme, um, I would take it as, as, um, as unless you substituted another persister agent, I would take it, you could take it up for months if you want to, to see if methylene blue is going to work though. I usually suggest people give it at least a two month trial. And if it is working, I've been known to leave people on it for up to six months at a time. Okay. All right. Thanks for the question. Hello, Mosby. You see, does bark go into joints or is that another infection? I feel like it's all my cerebral spine and upper neck. Doc says arthritis, but I got grandparents and nannies that don't have this. So uh, joint pain, joint inflammation can be part of Bartonella. It can also be part of Lyme. Okay. All right. Thanks for your question, Mosby. Good luck to you. Hello, Goli. Let's see. Also with the Toba and Casca, how many times a day and for how long? So a Toba and Casca are two herbs that I use to treat uh, Borrelia Lyme. Um, I've been known to use them up to a year at a time. I usually dose people up to 30 drops twice a day. I believe Buner would suggest you can even do it three times a day. But I have good effect doing 30 drops twice a day in most of my patients. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you. Hello, Sonia. Let's see. Can you take a Tobacascal if you also take uh, Almasartan to regulate high blood pressure? 
Um, I am not aware of any interaction problems uh, with that, and I have no problem using it in people that have high blood pressure. So I'd, I'd be okay with that. If you were in my practice, that's what I would say it's okay. Let's see here. Hello, Frank. Let's see. Dr. Ross, I recently saw an interview with Dr. Lindner, who said that much of the brain fog associated with Babesia can be attributed to mitochondrial damage in the brain from the disease. Do you agree? If you take ATP 360 to treat this, can it cross the blood brain barrier? Um, so I don't, I don't fully agree with Dr. Lindner. Um, uh, I'll leave it at that. I, I don't fully agree with him. Um, so keep in mind, whenever you have chronic infection in you, whether it's Lyme, Bartonella, Borrelia, one of the, again, it triggers the immune system to make cytokines. And a symptom of excess cytokines is brain fog. It's a symptom of it. Okay. So that's where some of that can come from. Um, additionally, um, brain fog and these illnesses may be due to some toxicity from the germs. All right. Um, and, and usually just getting the germs under control will result in lessening of that brain fog. Getting on anti-cytokine agents will help with that brain fog. Um, mitochondria injury could be part of it, but that doesn't mean you necessarily need to go after it right away because often if you start knocking your germ load down, the mitochondria are going to start repairing themselves on their own. I do start thinking about repairing for mitochondrial injury. So everyone, mitochondria are the energy factories found in every one of our cells. And the covering of the mitochondria is made up of a double layer of fat. When you have chronic infection going on, the immune system trying to get rid of those germs will make excess oxidizing agents. And those oxidizing agents can injure the covering of your mitochondria. And if the mitochondria covering gets injured, it results in sluggish operating mitochondria, basically. They um, have difficulty pulling sugar and fat to the inside of their mitochondria where they're supposed to be burned through a bunch of chemical reactions to create cell fuel. And in addition, uh, some of the electron transfers that take place in these reactions to create cell fuel uh, get, get hurt. They, they don't take place as well either, okay? So I usually will start thinking about fixing mitochondria if I'm about six months to nine months into a treatment and my attempts to lower cytokines and get germs under control still hasn't resulted in improvement in that brain fog, then I might, and, or, or in energy, then I might start thinking about uh, doing uh, mitochondria repair, okay? ATP 360 will cross the blood brain barrier. Uh, and so yes, it, it can. Um, and it, the reason it will is it's, it's a, the main, the main, although ATP, so ATP 360, everyone is a product made by research nutritionals that is made up of the fat, the phospholipid fats that make up the mitochondria membrane. Those same fats make up what is known as the blood brain barrier. Okay. So it will, it'll, it'll get through it's what the blood brain barrier is made because it's made of the same stuff basically. Okay. All right. Thanks for your question, Frank. Good luck to you. Do a quick screen share here. All right. So, in terms of energy and mitochondria, if you want to read more about how do you these things called mitochondria and what do you do to fix them if you have low energy from six to nine months on, take a look at my article here called "How to Fix Mitochondria and Get Energy in Lyme Disease." Okay. All right. And then of the products I was recommending that can repair the mitochondria membrane. Um, the one product we're both talking about is this one called ATP 360. And this is one of Research Nutritional's products. They've got they've done a good job with doing research on this one, showing improvements in energy and mitochondrial functions, and even improvement. I believe the research says improvements in brain health as well, too. Okay. Um, the only drawback to doing this ATP 360 is uh, in addition to these phospholipid fats that are in it, 
uh, research nutritionals has added a number of nutrients that help mitochondria work better. One of those is coenzyme Q10. And if you are on malarone, mepron, or etovoquone, and they all have etovoquone in them, um, etovo, uh, the uh, CoQ10 will interfere with the effect of the etovoquone. So uh, you need to be careful with that, okay? All right. Let's go back here. All right. All right. Uh, looks like I answered that one earlier. Let me get rid of that. I may have done this one earlier too. Let's see here. Ah. So I, what I'm doing is I'm now in, so my questions you all write show up in two different spots for me. One is the chat and one is something called Q&A. And I have just moved over to looking at ones that are in the Q&A section. And I'm seeing that some of you have posted them both in Q&A and in chat. <laughs> Bear with me here as I work through that. All right, here we go. Hi, Eileen, let's see. Thanks, Dr. Ross, for your help. Um, all these years. We appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Can Lyme or co-infections cause thickening of a gastroesophageal junction? Thanks. You know, I haven't seen that described before, nor um, have I seen uh, it in any scientific literature. That doesn't mean it can't happen. I'm just not aware of it. No. Thanks, for, thanks for your question. Good luck to you, Eileen. Hello, Yanni. Let's see, Dr. Ross. Oh, hi, Dr. Ross. Thanks so much for all the valuable advice you offer us. You're welcome. Let's see, very much appreciated. Just recently found you online. A few questions. What are the genetic markers that let one know they are not good at uh, ridding the body of mold? I'd like to check mine. I have a genome report, but don't know what to look for. Two weeks ago, I learned through some hygienic labs that I'm positive for Bartonella. I am IgG positive for Bartonella genus, Bartonella hensili, and Bartonella cantana as well. I was IgM indeterminate for Bartonella genus and Bartonella species. What do these results mean? Did I once have Bartonella? Do I have it now? I have some of the classic Bartonella symptoms, high anxiety, major insomnia, occasional air hunger, occasional electric shock to the body, brain fog, periods of being super hyper dysbiosis, et cetera. As well, I have high mold toxin levels of aflatoxin, ochratoxin, and citronin. I'm allergic to penicillin and aspergillus, and those were the primary molds we had in our house. Um, all right, let's see here. Yanni, it looks like there's a part two. Well, I'm not seeing a part two. Um, I, so that's what I have. You you may have written a longer question, but that's what I got. So I'll make a few comments here. Um, so there is the test that you look at to see if you have a genetic predisposition to develop mold toxicity is something called an HLA-DR test. And it's done through LabCorp uh, or Quest Diagnostic. Either one of them could do it. And, um, and then they give you a report that tells you about the genetic profile, okay? It's different than the kind of genetic profile that you have. So you would have to have your doctor specifically order this test called an HLA-DR profile, and then you have to interpret what the results mean, okay? Um, the, and so where you could look at that interpretation, the person that can help you interpret that uh, would be uh, Richie Shoemaker and his site on uh, mold toxicity. Dr. Shoemaker is the one that came up with this idea. I don't test for those mold, the genetic profile anymore, because even though Dr. Shoemaker came up with this theory that, you know, 25% of us have a genetic profile that makes it so we are predisposed not to be able to detox mold toxins, um, I have found even when people have a normal genetic profile that they still can have mold toxins in them. And if I remove those mold toxins, they get better. So the genetic profile test doesn't detect everyone with this problem. Number two, 
Um, having a genetic profile that you have a problem doesn't mean you get the problem, all right? So, and Dr. Shoemaker does not believe in doing the urine test that most of us do these days now to see if you have mold toxins in you. I think the better way to test for mold toxicity to see if you have the mold toxins in you is see if they're in you. Not if you have a profile, genetic profile that says you might get the problem, but actually see, are you peeing out too many mold toxins, okay? I think that's the better way of testing. But if you were to want to test for it, it's called an HLA-DR test. And then uh, you would have to go to Dr. Uh, Shoemaker's website called survivingmold.com. And at that website in the search bar, just type in HLA-DR interpretation, and you'll find his table where he walks you through um, how to go ahead and do that interpretation. Okay. All right. Um, all right. And then let's see. All right. So in terms of the Bartonella testing that you have here, Igenix does a test, a technique called an immunoblot. And they're looking to see if your immune system has made antibodies against the family of Bartonella. And in addition, they have the ability to detect four specific strains in that family, okay? Now, the family is made up of about 15 different strains that can infect humans. And the four that they can specifically detect are Bartonella cantana, Bartonella hensili, Bartonella vinsoni, and I believe they do Bartonella elizabethi too, okay? So they can detect those four specific ones. But if your genus or family test comes back positive, and you don't have one of those four, it may mean you have one of the additional 11 that you can get, okay? That's how I interpret that. Now, in, in the way that antibodies work, um, whenever we first get an infection, the first family of antibodies we develop against that infection are called IgM antibodies. And in most infections, they go away by around six weeks to three months, and they get replaced by IgG antibodies. And IgG antibodies are, can serve as the memory of your immune system too. So if you have IgG antibodies, it doesn't prove the germ is still in you, although it could still be. But it, it is because it's the memory of the immune system, it means for sure you had the infection before. But we got to remember that sometimes our immune system gets rid of stuff and manages it just fine, okay? So if I get somebody that has an IgG test positive for any infection, before I start treating for that infection, I want to know that they have any symptoms that suggest the infection is still there, all right? And these symptoms you listed out look pretty much like you've got Bartonella still there. Those are a lot of positive Bartonella symptoms, okay? So the way I would interpret this test, is the test says you've had the infection, your symptoms say it's still in you, okay? Yeah, and so that, that would give me enough uh, to say I must treat Bartonella, all right? And then um, again, you, you already know that you have high mold toxins. I don't know that you get any benefit by doing uh, the genetic profile, um, but if you want to do it, it's called HLADR testing. Okay, let me just do a screen share here for you. All right, so in the detox chapter, the mold illness one. So this is the mold toxin illness and Lyme disease. This is where I talk about Shoemaker. All right, so here, down here, I have the Shoemaker, the section called Shoemaker HLA-DR and Inflammatory Marker Labs, okay? And I talk about uh, how Dr. Shoemaker would wind up approaching this. But again, if you want to go ahead and, and follow up on his stuff, you would go, if you decide to do this, then, um, then you would go to his website, survivingmold.com, uh, to get the information about how do you interpret it, okay? Good luck to you. Hello, James. Hi, Dr. Ross. Do you have any thoughts on ketamine therapy for mental health? I've read that the main benefit is it can create new neural pathways it sounds a lot like limbic system retraining, but maybe a little quicker and more effective. 
would love to hear if you know anything about it or if you think it can help with people who can't shake the trauma of chronic Lyme. You know, um, so I work uh, here in town. Uh, there's a psychiatrist that is also a Lyme literate medical doctor named uh, Dr. Linda Williams. And um, she's been using uh, ketamine for her Lyme patients uh, with uh, difficult to treat depression and having uh, really good results with that. I share a couple patients with her that when she has added ketamine in, we have seen uh, good results with that. Um, so I, I think it could, if you can get somebody to do it for you, it might be worth a try. There's no sure shot with anything in Lyme disease and anything in mental health, but this one seems to be making some difference for a, a number of people. All right. Yeah. Good luck to you, James. Thanks. Hello, Jamie. Hold on here a minute. Greetings, is Dr. Ross. Let's see, I recently tested for Lyme Biogenics for the first time on March 6th. The results, the results are I tested positive for Lyme Immunoblot IgG at 23 and 31 and 41. Plus, also tested positive for Babesia fish, Babesia immunoblot IgM, and Babesia species. I uh, and Babesia species, the IgG was negative. My symptoms are these: idiopathic peripheral neuropathy, sunburn filling on the skins and legs and forearms, plus muscle, joint, neck, and shoulder pain. This week, also, an unexplained first-time red pad appeared on my forearm. What protocol do you believe can best heal my body, especially from peripheral neuropathy? Perhaps lumbar kinase, or would you recommend something else? Thank you so very, very much, Jamie. Right. Um, so in terms of Lyme and, and um Diagnosing Lyme, diagnosing Bartonella, diagnosing Babies, yeah. Um, to see whether you truly have them, I would need to know more, right? So I would need to know more what your symptoms are overall. And so for Lyme, the big four symptoms that people often will have is fatigue, um, uh, muscle and joint pain, um, cognitive dysfunction, and sometimes they can have neuropathy, okay? Bartonella can also give neuropathy. And even if you tested negative for Bartonella, you could still have Bartonella because the testing is going to miss it about 10% uh, of the time. And so symptoms that make me wonder about Bartonella would be pain on the soles of the feet, uh, neuropathy, um, uh, neurologic syndromes of any kind, actually, um, anxiety, depression, those make me wonder about it, air hunger, um, and then a rash that looks like stretch marks or scratch marks can sometimes be part of Bartonella. So I can't, <laughs> I would want to know, in addition to the soup of Babesia that you tested for and Lyme that you tested for, is there Bartonella? Because that would be important to know if you're going to try to treat, because that could be part of your cause of neuropathy as well, too. Okay. For the Babesia, you always have to be concerned of false positive test. And so although you test positive, I would want to know, do you have any symptoms that say Babesia? So I would want to know, do you have fatigue, which can be part of any of these infections, but do you have fatigue? Of all of the infections, Babesia probably tends to be a more fatiguing one. Do you have night sweats? Do you have air hunger? Um, do you have uh, skipping and racing of the heart? Do you have frontal headaches? Do you have repeated deja vu experiences? Those are all things that are highly suggestive of Babesia. Neuropathy tends not to be one of those symptoms we think of with Babesia. So what's the best thing to be on? It all depends on what the final diagnosis is. I know what you test positive for, but I would need to know a lot more about what your symptoms tell me. Do your symptoms agree with what you tested positive for? And if not, that doesn't necessarily mean you got these infections or that you um, have active infections, I should say. And then um, I would want to know, do you have Bartonella? Um, and just a negative test does not prove you have, uh, you don't have Bartonella. So 
I would hope that you have a doctor you're working with, a Lyme lead or a doctor that can help review symptoms and come up with an approach for you. Okay. All right. Good luck to you. Hi, Mickey. Do you recommend any antiviral prescription drugs for chronic EBV? My reactivation started 18 months ago and have tried money supplements, but levels are still elevated and active, still have symptoms. Um, so chronic EBV is kind of a difficult one, and it depends on what symptoms you mean, because fatigue can be caused by a lot of things, okay? All right, so if we look at um, 100 healthy people, and we pull them off the street, we'll probably find evidence in about, uh, about 5 to 10% of them. Actually, I think it's higher than that, of having elevated antibodies against Epstein-Barr virus, okay? Actually, let's look at this together. All right, let's see here. see if I have it in this. No, not in this article. Hold on here a minute. Okay, I think this is the one I want to see here. All right. Okay, so basically it looks like about 5% of healthy people have evidence of a, a bacteria infection called chlamydia and mycoplasma, okay? And for Epstein-Barr virus, HHV6, nearly 90% of all people have positive antibody testing. And for CMV, it's 60%. And these are healthy people, okay? So the thing that I want everyone to be aware of is just having elevated antibodies against one of these viruses does not mean that the virus is active in you because about 90% of healthy people have elevated antibodies against EBV, all right? So the question you need to ask is, do you really have active EBV? And, and I would need to know more, a lot more about your symptoms to help me look at that too, all right? What I tend to do because antibody testing is really not reliable to determine is, are these viruses reactivated? Did the immune system lose its ability to keep these germs under control? And again, just having elevated antibodies doesn't mean it lost the ability to keep these things under control. Many of us cohabitate with viruses in us and they never cause us any problems, okay? And so I like using a test called a Nagalase test. A Nagalase is um, uh, enzymes that are made by in the virus coverings. And viruses make Nagalase to make it so that a type of white blood cell in you that fights viruses called macrophages, it makes it so that the macrophages can't be activated. So uh, uh, basically there is a, an enzyme that's supposed to um, activate your macrophages, and it's called macrophage activating factor. And what Nagalase does is it breaks a couple sugar groups off of this macrophage activating factor, making it so they don't turn the, the macrophages on, all right? You can measure Nagalase. And if you have really elevated levels of Nagalase, it means you've got elevated viral load in your body, probably meaning that your immune system is not keeping these viruses under control. So I like to get, when I'm deciding if I'm gonna treat for chronic virus infections, I don't rely on uh, antibody testing, it's not accurate. And keep in mind, again, these viruses are found even in healthy people. You have elevated antibodies in 90% of people, right? So we have to be careful about over, over treating for these things, just because we fight it doesn't mean it's active, right? So I like to go ahead and do Nagalase levels. And the lab that does that is an independent lab out in New Jersey called Health Diagnostics Incorporated. 
this is something your physician can help you look at as well too. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Mickey. Answered that one earlier. Hello, Erica. Let's see. My daughter has been in treatment for Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia, and PANS for the past year and a half with a lot of ups and downs. We are currently seeing a ton of progress and improvements, but my daughter insists that there has been no improvement. How do we go about eventually ending treatment if she claims that her symptoms are static? Are there any lab tests that can confirm the germs have been eradicated? Or is it only based on lack of symptoms? She is very aggressive protocol of IV, Azith, Bactrim, Dapsome, Methylene Blue, Rifibutin, Artemisinin, NAC, LDN, Rocephin, and other supplements. How do we know where infection symptoms and pan symptoms begin? and how to eventually stop treatment. Uh, but it's complicated. And yeah, this is a very aggressive a treatment protocol you're on. Um, as I said earlier tonight, we don't have a test that says we're done, unfortunately. We just don't. I know my colleagues will try to look at antibody levels, and if they're down, they say that means the treatment's over, but that's not true. It could be got some immune suppression going on. It could be that um, the germs are hiding in a way the immune system can't see it. Another test you'll see people do is something called an Ellispot test. An Ellispot looks to see if your white blood cells called T cells um, remember seeing the germ. And since T cells only circulate for two months, if, they, if the test comes back negative, they would interpret that as saying that the immune system um, did not see those germs, therefore they must be gone. But keep in mind, the immune system didn't see the germs. The reason the immune system may not see the germs, they could be gone, or the germs are hiding in a place the immune system can't see it, or there's enough immune suppression going on that the immune system can't activate. You can't, the T cells don't work correctly, okay? So um, we don't have testing to say that we're done. Unfortunately, the best we can do is look at symptoms. When it comes to younger people, sometimes, uh, parental interpretation may have more accuracy than a child's interpretation. I don't know how old your, your daughter is here, though, to, to say that yes or no is true. Um, I usually like to consider both inputs when I'm trying to make a decision uh, with my patients, all right? So anyhow, the other thing that gets hard here, too, is these are hard drugs. I mean, your daughter may not feel any better, especially from being on Dapsone. Dapsone has many side effects that give you achiness, fatigue, um, Etc. And so she may just be feeling like crap from being on this stuff, and you may not be able to tell uh, whether you're getting improvement yet at all or not. Um, so anyway, those, those are some odds too. All right. Uh, good luck. I wish I had a better answer for you. Hello, Danny. Hi. Are floaters in the eyes a sign of persistent Lyme? I have tested positive in two separate tests in 2015 and 2020 for Marmot Labs in Germany. I have been trying to treat it for the past few years with Buner Herbs protocol, but still have fatigue, brain fall, and cold virus symptoms. I'm now trying lumbar kinase to see if persistent Lyme is the problem. I'm also trying transfer factors by research nutritionals. However, I've read on Research Nutritional website, you should not use transfer factors while taking lower kinase as they may destroy the transfer factors. Should I leave the transfer factors for now? And do you think lower kinase can affect the supplements such as peptides, et cetera? Thank you for these webinars. Um, So I'm just going to make a general comment. I may not give you the specific answer to your question here. So um, many of you may know, Buner actually just passed away earlier this year, my understanding, or last year, late, late last year. So we're not going to have his knowledge here anymore other than what he's already written. Buner 
did a lot of his writings about managing Lyme and Bartonella um, and Babesia before we became aware of the fact that Lyme had, and Bartonella specifically, have two different kinds of growth states. They can have growing forms and persister forms, all right? So one of the deficiencies in some of Buner's protocols, and believe me, his protocols are extensive, but one of the deficiencies may be that he uh, was not aggressive enough against what are known as persisters, okay? So for instance, his major two herbs that he likes to use uh, for treating uh, Lyme would be cat's claw and Japanese knotweed. Now, fortunately, those two both have the ability to treat persisters, believe it or not, okay? But it doesn't mean they always work, number one. When it comes to Bartonella, the knotweed would be the only thing that his protocol uses that would treat for persisters. His Siddhakuta Hutaniya would not. Now, he does put people on some persister regimens, but I would say he's not the strongest there, okay? So if I've got somebody on knotweed and they're not getting better, I'm sometimes going to want to pull it out and add in other types of anti-persister agents. And one of those I like using is cinnamon clove oregano capsules. Um, it is also possible to use cryptolepis, which he primarily uses for um, Babesia. Cryptolepis also can treat persister Lyme and persister Bartonella too. So sometimes adding that in will make a difference too. The lumbar kinase can be useful if you have either Bambesia or Bartonella. And that is one of the things that can make Bambesia and Bartonella hard to get over is they have the ability to wrap themselves up in a blood clotting protein called fibrin, a uh, formula that I call fibrin nest, and they attach themselves to your blood vessel wall. It's kind of walling themselves off from antibiotics and immune system. And lumbar kinase is effective against breaking down these fibrin nests, okay? And that could be another reason you're not getting better. And um, so if I were designing a treatment for you, I would probably prioritize lumbar kinase over transfer factors. Transfer factors are going to be more designed at boosting the immune system. But the bigger problem we tend to see isn't that here. It tends to be these fiber nests that can form, and it tends also to be these persisters uh, that form. And so those were, that's where I would try to strengthen your protocols is on the persister front and also on uh, treating the fiber nest as well too, all right? That, that's what I'd suggest. You probably should talk to your physician about that as well too, okay? All right. Good luck to you, Danny. All right. All right, everyone. That's it for me for today. I think we're at that spot here. What time is it? We are at that spot. All right. So I've enjoyed being with you here tonight. Um, keep an eye out on tomorrow morning's email or you get an email from me announcing that, um, that the recording is ready to be viewed. When you get that email, be aware that um, you can also use it to sign up for next week's webinar. All right. So we have a, a webinar planned for next week and the week after. So I'm doing four in a row. I did one last week, today, and then we're going to be doing uh, two more in the next two weeks then too. And I hope you join me for those. When you get the email tomorrow morning, help me reach more people. Uh, I appreciate if you do that and share the emails with others that might get some benefit here as well too. Okay. All right. Good night, everyone.